Welcome to Dare to Leap, a conversation and community supporting women just like you to gain the freedom, flexibility, and financial security you desire and deserve with CEO and founder of Virtual Expert Training, Kathy Guggenauer. This is Dare to Leap, and now here's the powerhouse tiara-wearing Kathy Guggenauer. Super excited to be back with you today at the Dare to Leap podcast. Today, I am talking with Tracy Bissett. She's a financial coach for entrepreneurs. She is uniquely qualified to coach all things money, given her hands-on experience as a former executive at one of Canada's big five banks. Formal financial education and chartered financial analyst designation is what she holds. She leads speaking engagements and is the executive producer and host of the Young Money Podcast, all focused on increasing financial fitness. And I got to tell you guys, I love that term financial fitness because I love fitness. Not so crazy about financial. You know, I'm a little scared about those numbers (laughs) like many of you are. But when you put fitness with it, I'm like, yeah, I can do that. Um, come, come, I'm sorry, got so excited about fitness. Tracy helps companies plan for the future, especially when it comes to cash flow. And we're going to dive into that today. She helps them perform better than those who don't plan their cash flow. Those who are leading, planning, and being proactive will thrive no matter what the economic environment. And that's what I'm excited to talk with her about today. So Tracy, welcome. And by the way, I might not have said your last name, right? I, I meant to ask you and forgot. I said, Bissett, is that right? Or is it? That's perfect. Oh, cool. That's a miracle. It looked really easy. And then I said it and I'm like, oh, maybe there's some fancier way to say this. No, most people don't have pronounced it that way. So you did awesome. And uh, thanks so much for hosting me, Kathy. I'm excited to be here. Well, I want to talk to you about a couple of personal things before we jump into the cash flow stuff that I added there on the end, because I want to be sure we talk about that. Um, But the personal things I want to talk about is number one, Canada. I love Canada. So where do you live in Canada? I live in Toronto, Ontario. um, So our biggest city that we've got. And uh, I grew up actually, though, on the east coast of Canada in Nova Scotia. Um, so I have uh, traveled all across the country and lived in different parts, but I make my home in Toronto. Well, it just so happens that Nova Scotia is where I have gotten to spend time. My husband and I lived in Halifax for oh, six wow. months and we actually rented a B&B. It was over the winter. So we rented a and b at Peggy's Cove. Oh, beautiful. And I'm actually recording today from Nova Scotia because I've been here during (gasps) a lot of COVID. So it was a little bit safer for most of the year. So that's Oh, that's so exciting. The nicest people in the whole wide world live in Nova Scotia. Oh my gosh. It literally, that experience changed my life because I'm from St. Louis, Missouri, which, um, you know, I love my hometown, but we have a lot of challenges with um, angry people and lots of gun (laughs) violence. Seriously. And I coming from that, uh, I thought everybody was angry all the time. Um, and when I got to Nova Scotia, uh, the Maritimers just embraced me. They didn't know me from Adam. They embraced me, made me feel welcome. And I will never forget. It just shifted my whole thought process. And so I just love Canada and particularly Nova Scotia. Oh, well, thank you. And a good way for those listening to kind of understand uh, what she means is if you stepped out on the street, even if you weren't at a sidewalk or at a crosswalk, um, the cars would stop and let you go. Um, they wouldn't <laughs> say, no, it's not, not your turn. It's not a place to walk. They would actually stop so you could walk across the street. So that's kind of what it's like here. Yeah, well, uh, you know, my husband and I were total strangers. We didn't know anybody. We were there from October. You imagine Peggy's Cove from October to April. <laughs> Most, uh, m- many of the places shut down. So it was sure. all like um, just the locals, places where they eat. And we would go someplace for breakfast or dinner. And literally people there would come up to us, introduce themselves to us and invite us over to their house for coffee. Well, in St. Louis, yeah, somebody, nobody's going to come up and introduce themselves to you, but friends might say, come over for coffee. They don't really mean it. You never go. So we of course didn't go. Cause that's what we're used to. <laughs> and a couple of nights later, knock, knock, knock on our door. And there were the people that asked us for coffee. They said, you didn't come by. So we're here. And they brought a pie. Oh, lovely. 
<laughs> so I was just like, I yeah. love this place. They mean it's, it when they say it. It's not like that in all of Canada, though. In Toronto, that doesn't happen so much, but uh, definitely uh, in Nova Scotia, it does. Yeah. Well, so that was one thing I wanted to make sure we talk about personally. And the other is I saw a golden retriever on your website and I have three golden retrievers. That's my girl, Rosie Tiger Lily. So she's my oh. best buddy. We're a therapy dog team during non COVID times. So we usually oh, visit once wow. a week with seniors. Um, so yeah, she's a, a great doggy. Wow. They are so special. Mm -hmm. um, I have a 14 year old who has lived four years longer than they thought he would. He's had epilepsy since he was four. He got hit by a car four years ago, had all kinds of complications from that. And this morning I watched him groom with his tongue, the head <laughs> for like 15 minutes of my five-year-old golden retriever who he loves and adores with all his heart. Oh, sweet. He yeah, watches Rosie, out for her. So Rosie's yeah. five. So like your younger one, oh, yeah. um, and, Molly, but she has, has epilepsy too, like your older one. So mm. Oh, I'm so very sorry complicated little doggies, um, but wonderful. Yes. Life is so much better having them. Oh my gosh. I know. Um, have you been able to get her epilepsy under control? Yes. So we've been able to oh, take her good. off meds and she's uh, having a seizure, <gasps> not even once a year. So it's very good. Oh, that's amazing. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Um, we weren't that lucky, but we were able to get it under control with meds and his seizures have gotten not further apart but the the actual Severity. episodes have lessened oh, um, because they used to be huge and now they're it, sometimes I don't even notice and all of a sudden I'll feel a little shaken I'm like oh my gosh she's having a seizure um but at 14 you know Those are bonus years, for, yeah. more heat. <laughs> they really are and he's a really happy boy so um well thank you for sharing that and anybody if you if you think life is good with a doggy uh, or you're wondering, go for it. I love dogs. And you have two. What's your other this one? This one. No, I just have one. So there oh, I just have two one. with I'm me sorry. right now. We're looking after my um, brother's puppy. It's a Cocker Spaniel. So she's oh. uh, very energetic because she's only five months. So it's just a temporary <laughs> visitor. <laughs> we've got a dog coming for a visit this weekend. And so I understand. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I will, it's always uh, a treat. We'll give a shout out to the listeners though, to make sure if you're getting a dog, you do the budgeting um, because my, my Rosie has been extremely expensive and we're just uh, recovering off uh, a leg surgery. She ruptured her knee ligament. So uh, get oh, no. some insurance or, or be saving up because doggies can be expensive. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, ab you know what? That is a really good tip because you're, I mean, I feel like we're lucky if we do not have, um, some kind of major bill and, you know, it's just, everything's expensive. Food's expensive. Mm -hmm. Drugs are expensive. I mean, um, the drugs that we do for, uh, Jack, the one who has epilepsy, they're a dollar a day, how much yeah. we spend on that. And that, you know, that's, on top of everything else. So oh, we, but we were paying so much more. I was paying 200 a month for the epilepsy wow. medicine. Yeah. Oh, Which wow. was mostly that's covered really with my lot. insurance plan. So that was, I was glad I had insurance. Oh, that's but good. Yeah. Just know what you're getting yeah. into because it's heartbreaking to not be able to take care of your animal because you can't afford it. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So PSA, <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> All right. Now, Let's talk about numbers. So Tracy, how did you get into the financial fitness biz? So ever since I was a little kid, I absolutely loved money. I learned at the age of seven that you could use money to get stuff that you wanted or to do things that you wanted. Um, so I would have little games or clubs or sales in my neighborhood when I was a kid. And so I I got that message and I think I learned it a lot younger than, than people do. And some people never really get that message, but money doesn't need to be emotional. It's not something that your whole life is tied up into. It's really this tool you can use to do things. So I did a lot of volunteer work. I had businesses throughout kind of junior high, high school, uh, went on to business school and then got into banking. And there I did lots of volunteering. 
And when I, I kind of wrapped up my banking career, I thought, what are all the things I like to do and how can I package them together and create a business I like? Um, and I knew that on the personal side, people were struggling to understand their uh, finances. Um, I knew that because of all my work with entrepreneurs, that that was a challenge as well. And um, certainly in Canada, our school system does a really poor job of educating young people. I know in the U.S. it's not much better. Um, and, and people aren't equipped and certainly not equipped personally and then not equipped on the business side. So I've really made it my mission to increase education for anybody who wants it um, so that they can take control of their money. And um, when you think about it, people always talk about it like financial literacy. So if you don't have it and you don't know about money, all of a sudden you're illiterate and it puts you really back on your heels and you feel bad. So I wanted to come at it from this place of positivity where we're going to be fit. We're going to start wherever we are. So just like the physical fitness that you're so fond of, Kathy, we might be taking that first step off the couch. We're going to walk around the block. Maybe we're going to learn about different kinds of bank accounts, or we might be farther down the spectrum of, of fitness. And so we're going to train for a marathon physically. We could be um, learning things to become a more sophisticated investor. So we're all at different places. And if we, we try and do one thing every day, take in perfect action, we can certainly take control of our financial fitness and become better than we were yesterday. Well, that makes me feel better knowing that you can take one step a day because a, a true confession here, and you've probably heard this many, many times, Tracy, but uh, financial fitness was the last thing that I was thinking about when I started my business and as my business began to grow. And fortunately, I had coaches, business coaches who said, uh, if you don't know your numbers, you have no idea what your business is actually doing. And even after that, I kept hesitating. So anybody that's like me, who's like, uh, those numbers scare me. What are like the first couple of steps that you recommend them taking to start learning the, about their numbers, knowing their numbers? Um, first of all, realize it's not your fault. So like I said, nobody taught you, <laughs> you created your business because you're excellent at whatever you do. And so that's where you're starting. So we kind of shedding that baggage up front. Maybe it's, oh, thank you. Your, maybe it's looking <laughs> the in your bank just account. Lifted. Yeah. Uh, maybe it's looking in your bank account. If you have financial statements, looking at them, but just starting to do something. And the easiest way to start something is to make a new routine, set aside 30 minutes a week, put it in your calendar, make yourself do it, find people to help you. You don't need to do it alone. Um, two of the biggest issues I see are that uh, when it comes to kind of stepping up and taking responsibility, um, one is if I just work really hard, it's going to work itself out. So I don't need to, so kind of head in the sand, or I've delegated that to the accountant and the bookkeeper, and I don't need to be responsible and absolutely work with professionals to support you. But at the end of the day, you're still the CEO of this business, whether you're yourself or you've got a team and you need to be accountable for the numbers so you can drive ahead to hit your goals. It's not, not about knowing numbers for the sake of the numbers. It's about how does it impact your business and, and lead you to where you want to go with your goals. Mm, okay. So um, at what point in a business, a business that you're starting, okay, let's say we're just starting, I'm somebody that's just starting my business. I'm getting it going. I'm just, I've got my first client. I'm making my first little bit of money. At what point should you hire someone um, like you? Um, now you're a financial coach. Mm -hmm. Does that mean you, you coach them through the numbers or do you actually also do the numbers? Can you talk a little bit about what you do? And Absolutely. at what point do you think somebody would be ideal for somebody to get started with, with this? So as a financial coach, I'm really on the education side. So helping you understand how your business operations fit with the numbers, understand the financial statements. Um, most business owners know that the profit and loss or the income statement where you have your sales and your expenses, but then how does that translate to cash flow? So I'm all about transferring what I know um, to the business owner. So we've got to do cash flow forecasting and look at um, when we actually do business with someone, when does the money hit our bank account and does that line up with the sales and, and go into some more education pieces like that. Uh, so I don't do bookkeeping. I'm not an accountant. And so I am in a position to certainly make recommendations. Uh, I think the earlier you can in your business journey, get started working with someone, the better it's going to be for you. Um, but it 
it really depends on your uh, budget. Um, sometimes people are leaving corporate careers and starting a business. And so you might have a bit more of a budget. Um, but if you're just starting kind of out of school, that may not be the case. So the earlier you can do that, the better. Um, but there's no shortage of resources if you don't have the means to get started with a coach. There's podcasts, there's books, there's YouTube videos. Um, and lots of them you can find on, on even my site um, so that you can see different things that can help you, but not to be afraid um, of asking questions. And some people will say, well, I'm going to get a bookkeeper when I, when I get a little bit bigger, why not set up properly at the beginning? If you're a small company, you're not actually going to pay them very much because they won't have very much work to do every month. So start your books off properly. If you're really at the idea stage, I'm a huge proponent of doing a business plan for a couple of reasons. One, you want to make sure that your idea is something that you can actually sell that people will pay money for, and you can actually make money from. Um, because sometimes we have ideas and we think we're going to sell it to somebody and it doesn't work out. So take the time to do that market testing, but then also to work through uh, from the number standpoint, your pricing so that you can make sure you're going to make money off of what your plan is. And, and it's not a waste of time. If you come to the end of the business plan and you see, you know what, I'm not going to make as much money as I need doing this. You might pivot who you're targeting. You might pivot your idea. And all of that is valuable time and money saved up front uh, because now you can get going with the next iteration. So the sooner we can configure out what that is, then the better off we're going to be in our business. Yeah, I love that so much. Um, several things on that point. So for example, I just talked with someone who, um, you know, I teach women how to start virtual assistant businesses and um, I just talked to somebody who had started her business about six months ago. She already had like three clients, um, super excited about her business, really excited to get going. And when I talked with her about uh, how much she was charging and, you know, she told me, she's like, I think I'm really at the right point in what I'm charging. And I said, how many hours are you actually working? And then we did the numbers to see how much she was actually earning per hour. It was like $6. Mm-hmm. And what, and when we realized that she was like, oh my gosh, uh -oh. no wonder I don't feel like I have any money. I don't have any money. Yeah. Unfortunately, <laughs> that's, uh, yeah. that's all too common. And I work uh, generally with entrepreneurs across all industries up to about sales and 2 million. So really the, the small businesses and the issues are the same, but I would say 85% of those companies are not pricing profitably. And the biggest culprit are those service providers because they think it's my time. I don't really need to charge. Um, so my best yes. piece of advice on that is to um, think about your business growing and you have to pay someone else to do what you're doing. What's the minimum you have to pay that person? Because I guarantee the the owner is not paying themselves that much as it is right now. And then could you still do it um, if you had to pay that market rate? So that's a good way yeah. to think about it. And it kind I of love that distances it from you so that it's not, oh, I've got mm -hmm. unlimited hours. It's my business. No, let's mm -hmm. let's do it practically. Mm -hmm. um, and do you have a feel for um, this is just something of interest to me that I'm kind of I keep looking at. Um, do you have a feel for if there is a difference between the genders of just psychologically being able to price higher, too high, too low, just right, um, based on like their, you know, just their own mindset even? Yeah, mindset is a problem for both. And I work with everyone. So I do see it. And I, I can tell you in probably 75% of my engagements, there's tears, men and women. Um, oh, either wow. from like frustration, can't believe I let it get to this point, or I, I had a breakthrough and I get it. Like all the pieces fit together. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I would say a lot more of the worth issues come up with women. Um, they still happen mm -hmm. with men. Um, uh, but what that really happens, I, I mean, what, what that's coming back to is we form our views around money when we're super young, like between five and seven years of age. And I shared that, like, I loved money and I learned how to use it as a tool and I was super unemotional about it, but whatever is going on in your household, when you're that little kid that stays with you, that's your baggage, that's your money story. So if there was yelling, if there was going without, if there was doors slamming, whatever was happening stays with you. And unless you actually dig into that, you can't change it. Um, cause you don't realize it. So even uh, right now, just think about last time you got a bill, what, how did you feel? Did you get some pit, like a ache in your stomach? Did you think, oh my gosh, I'm not going to be able to pay that. Um, and you can certainly change your mindset around money. Um, but nobody's going to pay 
whatever price you tell them, if, unless you're confidently talking about it and articulating the value. And women are, are known for just undercutting themselves. And so if you actually do the legwork with your business plan, validate who's going to be your customer and know that you are providing something of value, you can stand a lot stronger in that. And it takes practice and you're going to have to, to keep uh, reassuring yourself and, and stand behind it. But nobody's going to pay for something if they don't see the person is confident uh, in what they're offering. Well, I could not agree with you more because um, I have literally experienced multiple times where I knew exactly how good um, some a VA was at what service she provided. And I referred her to a client. She had a conversation with that client. The client came back to me and said, I'm not going to hire her because she doesn't seem confident in what she does. And I said, she's fabulous at what she does. And the person said, I'm really sorry, but I don't, yeah. you know, I, I don't, I can't see it myself. And so I'm not going to be able to hire her. And uh, it, it, that's what it's I try to teach too. Yeah. And it is heartbreaking thing, because I know. It's the same kind of thing too, when they, they do this research around job postings and men and women applying. Um, so if the job posting has 10 things they'd like you to have, the man thinks he's perfect and he's got two of them or one of them and the woman's got seven and she doesn't think she should apply. So she doesn't. Yes. And so there's a little bit of that going on too. Like the guy will check out a price and it's not that he doesn't have insecurities, but he doesn't get so caught up all the time in his head about it. And so right. if you do legwork and you see that what you offer is valuable and you're pitching it to the right person, you can stand mm -hmm. confidently with facts. It doesn't have to now come down to how you feel about yourself. Um, the other piece of advice I would give too, is we've got all these people in our life who are, who love us and they want to be supportive, but sometimes they don't know how. And so friends and family might make comments. Who do you think you are? Why are you charging that much? Wow. What are you, you're just doing some stuff in a website. What could you possibly be doing? That's so valuable. So sometimes you have to control the conversations and you might be like, you know what, um, to your cousin, I love you. I like spending time with you, but we're not going to talk about my business. We're going to talk about everything right. else, but there's where I'm putting the boundary right. in. And so sometimes we have to wrangle with the people who love us and, and get their voices out of our heads too, because that's not helping us. Yeah. Did it, did you actually have a conversation with my mother? Because those <laughs> words you use literally came out of her mouth. <laughs> in, in addition to um, how's that little typing job you have going? <laughs> Yeah. And at one point I was charging $45 an hour when I was a newer VA and she's like, nobody would ever pay you that for typing. <laughs> so that's the other important thing, financial <laughs> advice too. like, make sure like the source is credible. Um, mm -hmm. Like if, if I came to you and started giving you advice about cutting someone's hair, you might believe me because I could be persuasive, but I've got no business right. talking about that. So right. take advice from people who know. If you know people right. know nothing about what you do, just kind of brush it off your shoulder. Great. Thanks for your feedback, mom. Love it. See yeah. ya. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That is great advice because the, like my husband, he is a very smart man. Um, he knows nothing about the online world at all. He could never help me price anything. And if I took his advice mm -hmm. on how to price I would be out of business very quickly. And, and if I took my mom's advice on how to price, my husband's would have me charging <laughs> way over what the market will bear. And my mother would have me charging. Um, I live in the middle of nowhere. My mother would have me charging the $10 an hour that people can get here for the very few jobs that there are. So really good advice. Take uh, somebody like you, Tracy, who you're an expert at what you mm -hmm. do. Um, so, okay. I so I wanted to, to go find back to one of people. Yeah. And so get recommendations from people, you know, and trust, um, don't just randomly, um, take advice from people. So, right. I like, I like to personally, I like to work with people who have already done what I want to do. So they've mm -hmm. already gone through it. They've made the mistakes potentially they've made the money I want to make and they can guide me yeah. to where I want to go. So, um, like you, you've helped many people, <laughs> many entrepreneurs become, yeah. um, businesses with $2 million in revenue. Yeah. So one of the other things that you mentioned was the money story. Do, as a financial coach, do you help people overcome that? Is that part of what you help them do? 
I do if they want to go there. So not everybody wants to, um, but um, certainly if I'm hearing them say repeated things that I know is really tied up in the emotion of it, um, they would never pay that. Oh, I couldn't do that. Um, then I'll start digging into, would you like to explore that a little bit further? Can we talk about that? Because uh, the majority of the population has a scarcity mindset where if you're getting more, Kathy, I'm getting less. And that's just the way that they understand it to be. But there's really mm -hmm. practical ways to kind of stop those thoughts, observe what's happening, change the way you're thinking, change who you're spending time with. And you can do that over a little bit of time. And if you're committed to doing that, you can, can make those changes. So lots of the limitations we put on our, our business are really coming from ourselves. They're not from other people. Yeah. Oh, I love that so much. I love the scarcity versus abundance mindset. And, you know, I had it, you know, and I find that each level I go up in my business, it kind of rears its ugly mm -hmm. head again. Um, so any, and I know this is asking a lot of you, but any little tips that you can give on how somebody can even begin to any books or anything like that, that you recommend um, anything to help them begin to overcome that scarcity mindset? Yeah, I've got some a couple of tips that are easy to put into practice, um, easy, easy individually, but hard to do it as a routine. So number one, start observing your reactions to anything money related. Start listening to the things you're, that you're saying in your head or are coming out of your mouth and just sit with it. Um, so you can see kind of where you are. Um, three strategies to actually um, change. And it's again, it's a spectrum. Nobody's completely scarce. There's going to be other situations they feel abundant, but we can move closer to abundance. So number one, uh, practice gratitude. So I woke up today, mm -hmm. I could eat breakfast, I had a hot shower, I had clothes to wear. When we start focusing on all of those positives, we don't get so caught up in the negative. And when you look at your life, you have so much going for you. Everyone does. Um, and and there, we are all better off than others that we know. So if we can focus on that, um, automatically, we've got more positivity. Uh, number two, you've probably heard it, uh, we are the product of the five people we spend the most time with. Um, so Think about who you're spending time with. If you're spending uh, half your week with your mom or on the phone with your mom, <laughs> that's probably going to going to impact your thinking. And so, right. um, like you said, you like to work with people and coaches and spend time with them. People who've already done what you've done. They are probably really positive. They probably are looking for solutions to problems. They maybe you get the five minute pity party for what didn't go well, but then you're getting on to how do I fix this and how do I deal with it. So spend, focus on who you're spending time with, and if You've got too many negative people, not that you're shedding them from your life, but maybe you're then changing what the conversation is going to be about or the activities that you do. And the third one is actually to make a little bit of space. So when we're overscheduled, when we're too busy, it's overwhelming. We can't really get a handle on calmness. So if we can make a little bit of space to do something fun, go for a walk, whatever we like to do. I know walking with Rosie is like the best thing. Um, because it's just a break. And you, I process lots right. of things when I'm walking. I'm not intentionally trying to think about them or solve them, but it just happens. So practice gratitude, think about who you're spending your time with and make changes if you need to, and then give yourself a little bit of space. And all of that is going to move you over time to have more of an abundance mindset. Oh, I love that. Those are such great tips. Free to implement. And and they're simple, but they're hard to do repeatedly. Yeah. So Maybe if you make a little cheat sheet and every day you tick off, did I do these things? Um, over time, right. you will see that impact. And just like you said, every time a, a situation that, that you're, brings you to a new level, there's going to be new things that rear up, but stick with those basics and ground yourself. And um, it, it's going to turn, but it's not, and not like yeah. flicking a switch uh, and nobody, uh, right. really, not that many people start out like me thinking of money as this tool. So you've got to be able to kind of disassociate. And so, if your car breaks down, are you, are you cursing that? And why does this always happen to me? Or because you've got your emergency fund built up. Oh, it's okay. I had the money. So not great that it happened, but it's okay because I saved because I knew something would happen or the, the surgery with my dog. Cause I knew she would get into something and it's just a matter of when, <laughs> not, not if, but when. <laughs> yeah, they always do. Um, oh. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Such great tips. Thank you for sharing that. Um, now I had something, 
something else on my mind. And then I went to the dog thing. I can get so easily, you know how people say bright, shiny objects. My it's bright, shiny object is anything to do with a dog, a puppy, a dog. Um, and they're just so wonderful. So um, when, let's talk a little bit about cash flow now, because mm-hmm. I, I will tell you that I've been in business since 2001. I have had four different businesses all in the virtual assistant type of arena. Um, and still, I don't really feel like I understand cash flow. Okay. And how you can, because part of what you said I've heard, um, or what I read on your website, um, is what I've heard before, which is that you can um, understand your cash flow and forecast your cash flow and even like, you know, somewhat manipulate. And I don't know that that's the right word your cash flow. Manage. Manage. (laughs) That's the word. Manage your cash flow. So can you talk a little bit about that? And Mm -hmm. um, I don't even know what specific question to ask other than I need to know, understand it better. And I personally, the other entrepreneurs that I work with, I don't think the majority of them really understand it that well either. All right. So when we think about your income statement or your profit and loss, we're thinking about the sales in our business and all the expenses. The way that that gets set up is according to accounting rules. So we're going to put that aside right now. We're going to talk about cash flow. So very simply, money comes into our account, money goes out, and the timing that it happens, that's usually kind of the, the unwieldy part. So the easy way to think about it, even if we think about one customer who's going to do business with us, They sign up and they say, okay, Kathy, I want to work with you. They sign their contract. When does money start to flow to you? Do you take a retainer? Do you get money up front? Do you do work for the month? And then they pay you. So think about how the cash actually moves to you in relation Mm -hmm. to your time. And so if we can think about it very isolated with one customer, then we can do it for all of our customers and everybody who's working with us. Um, So I know the VA that I work with, I pay her for a certain number of hours at the beginning of the month. That's for the month that's still to come. So she Mm -hmm. gets her money up front, she does her work, and then we do it all over again. So in that kind of situation, that's ideal because you should have the cash up front to cover all the expenses that you're going to have to pay. So you got your money right in at the beginning and then all your outflows are happening as the month goes by for your internet, for those subscriptions you need for the different softwares. Uh, if you have any contractors to pay them and if you're profitable, you should have more cash than you, you need um, to pay all of your bills. And so the problem becomes is in different industries, it, it can change. So event planning, nobody's going to do a wedding for you unless you pay them 50% up front when you book them and then 50% the day or the day before the event. If you're doing work with corporations, though, um, bigger, um, not small business, you might have to do work with them for a couple of weeks, even a month, then you invoice them and they don't pay you for 60 or 90 days. Now you're trying to pay all your bills, but you haven't got any cash coming in. And so understanding what your specific cash flow cycle is in your business is really the key. It's great if you understand other people's, but it doesn't really matter. Yours is what matters. So um, in a, if you're always charging up front in your VA business, it should work out if you're profitable. There's going to be some months, maybe you have some client, like the volume of clients goes down and then you might need to have had some buffer uh, where you saved up some of your excess cash in prior months, but it should all generally work through and be okay. Um, or in, in, by the way, in my training program, I go over all the different uh, models of how you can charge because there's like, mm-hmm. the one you're talking about is either a retainer rate or a block of time, depending on how they have it set up. And then um, there's the, you know, waiting until you see how much work you actually have to do yeah. in that month and then charging for that actual on the first of the next month. And if or you do it that way, or, it, yeah, yeah, projects, yeah. Um, Exactly. Um, but if you do the in arrears, it's just one month that you're waiting for. And then that regular client is paying you every month also. Mm-hmm. So um, that's better than the 60 to 90 day delay oh, sure. in the corporations. But if you're working with corporations on a regular basis 
And once you get past that first initial 90 days, then you've got that regular coming in too. So like what you're talking about, let me see if I understand is know when that money's coming in and then you're on a regular basis and then you know what your cash flow is going to be and what you have to plan for. Based yeah, if you that. think about it in an Excel spreadsheet at the top of the sheet, you'd have what are we starting with? So um, we talk about, well, the first of the month, we have this much in our account. This much is supposed mm -hmm. to come in during the month and this much is supposed to go out. What's the number at the mm -hmm. bottom when we add all those together? And so mm -hmm. if you know you're getting started in your business, you're going to have all corporate clients. What are my expenses going to be? Let's say for 90 days, just so we have a buffer. As long mm -hmm. as you've got enough cash to get you through that, then you should probably be okay. Um, because then mm -hmm. the cash is going to catch up and you're going to be on that regular cycle. Um, that's barring no loss of clients, uh, no one un unexpected things, but keeping it super simple. So what comes into my bank account, what goes out and what's the timing that that happens. Um, even when I'm working with students, I tell them like, think about your rent. If you have a part-time job, you usually need to save up money from multiple paychecks to cover that one rent. That's how we need to think about it in our business. How much do we need mm -hmm. to have there to cover that monthly expenses? And a lot of business owners will, will talk about their run rate or their expense rate or burn rate. Um, and mm -hmm. that's, I've that's, heard their, that. that's their chunk of expenses they've got to pay in a month always. So what's the consistent uh, amount? A, the run rate is your monthly expenses you have to pay always. You're kind of set expenses. Yeah. And um, okay. it could be some level of um, variable, like your, if you have contractors, but where, you know, generally it's say it's 10,000 a month, that way you can plan mm -hmm. for, you know, I'd feel comfortable if I had a cushion of 20,000 in my account or available to mm -hmm. me, if I had some credit mm -hmm. or I had some in my account, I'd feel really comfortable mm -hmm. if I had 20,000. So if there was any delays in people paying me, I know I'm still good. Okay. So like I pay commission to my mm -hmm. salespeople instead of a you know, flat rate or yep. a fixed rate, I pay commission. So would that be considered part of what you're talking about? Or would that be outside that? Um, well, if you're going to factor in the sale, run the cash coming in from the sale, um, then you know, you're going to have the, the cash there. So I, I, okay. would, I would so include it. Yep. Okay. All right, cool. But anything. I, that's I mean, really in my mind, I, I, inc I include it in my mind because I know about every month about how much mm -hmm. my expenses are going to be. And that includes the commission because I pay commission every single month. It's not like there's months that I don't pay a commission. If I didn't, I'd be in trouble. <laughs> Absolutely. So knowing if you're profitable is the good first step, because then anything mm -hmm. you have to pay because you made the sale, you know, you're good because mm -hmm. if I make a sale, I know I'm going to have the money to pay that. It's just, would you have the cash on that day? And so knowing that total mm -hmm. really helps you. And so mm -hmm. I'll work with okay. uh, across different businesses. Some people will say, you know, I will always want to have access to 90 days worth of that run rate and that mm -hmm. total. So whether that's a combination mm -hmm. of like a, an overdraft or line of credit and some cash, or for some people, it's, I just want to be able to cover the next two weeks. And mm -hmm. depend, as your wow. business matures and you're able to have more stable cash flow, that number usually gets mm -hmm. bigger. So okay. it's tighter at okay. the beginning when you're, when you're figuring it out, but figure out what is that number you've got to pay every month and, and strive to, mm -hmm. to have cash at that level. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so I love that conversation. Thank you. That, uh, that makes me feel as you talked about it, I'm like, oh, I do know that <laughs> that's one of those things that I'm like, the word cash flow still scares me. But after you said that, I'm like, oh, I, I know all those things she just said. So I need to increase my confidence on that. Absolutely. And um, sometimes that's the thing. It's um, vocabulary. So it's not yes. about knowledge. It's just the way I describe it is different than the way you know it. But it's the same thing. It's good to know the the language too, though. Yeah. Um, I feel I always feel more confident when I understand the language too, because you know that is a specific financial speak is a specific language. Is sort of yeah. like um, sports analogies. I don't Absolutely. understand most sports analogies. And in the past, I didn't understand most fi financial language, but I'm learning financial language. The sports analogies, they can, I'm still, I just don't <laughs> care because I'm not a sports person, but it's pretty funny. Um, so one of the things that you mentioned that I just want to see if you've got any advice on this um, is when you have, and I'm going to call them subcontractors. Um, so when you bring in, you were talking about, you know, mm -hmm. Think about how much money you earn. And then what if you had to pay somebody else to do that work, pay part of that to them to do that work? Do you have any advice on how to determine like what percentage of what you're earning you should pay your subs or um, any other way? Do you have any kind of rule of thumb or anything on how to de determine how much to pay? 
So you want to think about um, their skill set in the market and what what would be what could they earn on their own, um, and then yeah. that's going to be discounted because you're the one sourcing the business. So there needs to be an amount that goes to that. And then if they're using your tools and resources, they need to be almost like the, the fee for that after using your programs and, and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it's going to be variable depending on um, where you are, what their skill set is, as well as your overhead. Um, but I, I think you probably want to keep them around 50 to 60% of what you're going to charge out for you to be able to make some profit as well as to to cover off kind of that business development portion so even myself i'm a a contractor with the business development bank of canada they source me financial education mandates with entrepreneurs um, because they've sourced them i don't make as much as if i would source them myself and that's that's just the way it is i'm not doing that business development and so that does need to be accounted for in there right right yeah um i find that Again, we're back to the mindset issue. Mm-hmm. Um, most VAs are 99.9% women. Um, and most of them want to overpay their subcontractors at their own detriment. And they don't realize that they're overpaying until suddenly they're like, why don't I have any money? Mm-hmm. Why are my subcontractors making more than I am? And when I talk with them about it, they're like, yeah, but they're doing the work. They should make the most money. And I'm like, "Mm, which, which is more important, actually getting the client in the door, doing all the the harder part and all that. It is the harder part. Yeah. Yeah. And the more overhead also, like you talked about. Yes. Um, So you have to make, I think sometimes they don't include that overhead and that time Mm -hmm. that they spend doing the marketing and the sales. And once they actually look at it that way, then they go, Oh, oh now I see. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, if those, um, thank you for sharing. If those that. people thought it was so simple, they would probably do it themselves. Oh, and yeah, go out. exactly. And it, finding clients is hard. It's a definite skill. You need to be able to go out and do that. And everyone can learn it, but not everyone's suited for it. Oh, yeah. Everyone can learn it. I totally agree with you because. Um, that was, that was one of my <laughs> pieces of contention when I worked at a corporate job, I wanted to learn how to be a salesperson. I did not know how to be a salesperson, but I wanted to learn and they would not let me, they said, no, you're not, you don't have, you don't have the skill naturally. And I'm thinking, That's I think this could be way learned. Of thinking. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I have indeed learned it. And I'm so glad I did because Tracy, one of the things that I feel really comfortable with when you talk about all this financial stuff and everything and the abundance and the scarcity is once you know how to get clients, whether it's, you know, working with somebody as a subcontractor, so you can get clients that way or getting them yourself and especially getting them yourself, no matter what happens, you will be okay. Yeah. Because you can pivot to, even if like, for example, in 2008, um, in the U S the real estate market tanked and I had 70 real estate agents as clients at that time in my VA business. And I went overnight from 70 to 20, mm-hmm. like, well, not overnight, but 30 days, literally yeah, 30 days. Sure. I went from 70 to 20 and I was like, wow, what just happened? And what am I going to do? And once I calmed down, took that time, like you're talking about to process it, <laughs> um, which was really important. Cause you know, an, an immediate panic. Oh my gosh, I just lost that many clients. What am I going to do? Then I went, Oh, I still have all my skills. I still know how to do this. I just need to find a new target market. Exactly. And, and that's what I did. And within, in the next 30 days, I was full. My practice was full again, just with a new target market. Yeah. And, um, th- that, that just always, uh, talk about job security to me, that's real job security. Yeah. Being flexible and adaptable and seeing who needs what I have. And, but it starts yeah. with knowing that what you're offering is valuable and that there's yes. a, a lot of people who can make use of it. You just have a finite amount of time, so you can only serve so many people. So it's, that's, right. that's part of the, the mindset as well. One other piece on the subcontractors, which might be a, a benefit to the audience is thinking about how you pay them. So if you know you're getting paid in 
30, 60, or 90 days later, maybe there's clauses within the agreement that they don't get paid till you get paid by the customer. And so thinking that through, and it's important to have those conversations up front before somebody starts working with you. You don't just do it to them. That can't, can't be the way that it goes. But if you're out laying every two weeks, but you're not getting paid for 90 days, um, is that really how you want that to happen? And that comes back to cash flow. But important thing to think about when you're you're setting up your your work with your subcontractors. Thank you so much for saying that. That is really important. That is really important. Yeah. So Tracy, oh my gosh, I could talk to you all day long. <laughs> um, but we are coming to the end of our time. So could you talk a little bit? I if if, if others are like me, I'm just like I need to learn more from Tracy. So if others are thinking about that, uh, tell us a little bit about the type of clients you'd like to work with and then how they can get in touch with you if they want to find out more about working with you. Absolutely. So I love working with clients who know they want to take control of their financial future. They are action takers. They know they got to make a change and whatever level of knowledge they've got is okay. And I work across all industries with men and women. Um, doesn't matter where you are from a geography standpoint, and it doesn't matter what industry you're in. Uh, all of that works well with me. Um, sales generally up to about 2 million. Um, so you're up for the learning, you're, you're ready to roll up your sleeves and do the work and, um, and, and it's going to work out well. Um, so that's the other thing too. It's important to be really kind to yourself when you're on the financial fitness journey, because you're going to have really great you're going to have a great week where everything goes well, and then you're going to step off the path and have some missteps. So have patience with yourself to get back on track. Uh, I do have a gift for your audience um, because I know some people are probably, <gasps> Ooh, I love a gift. people are probably inspired to get taking action. And so I've got a money meeting agenda, so you can download it right away and get started. So you can grab it from cashcoach.biz. And the first meeting might be just looking at the money meeting agenda. But like I talked about, carve out some 30 minute segments in your calendar once a week, start making your, your money and your finances and your business a regular part of your routine, just like sales, just like client delivery, marketing, all that kind of stuff. So money meeting agenda at cashcoach.biz. Um, that'll take you to my website later. And if anybody has questions or comments, would love to hear from you on LinkedIn. So Tracy has an E and Visit has two S's, two T's. Fabulous. And the money meeting agenda that you can use during that weekly 30 minute session mm -hmm. you were talking about. Is that what Absolutely. that's for? Yes. I love that because when you were saying have a 30 minute meeting on this, I'm thinking, what am I oh going to do from that? <laughs> yeah. I don't, am I just going to look at these numbers and go, what, what are they? <laughs> so I love that. Thank you so much for providing that. That's a wonderful tool. You are welcome. And I also love that you can work with anyone, no matter where they are geographically. Yes, that's the fun part. Uh, and I love working um, in all different industries. It's really exciting for me to see what people have created out of nothing. And there's so many inspiring business owners out there. Oh, there are, aren't there? I just, I mean, just when I think I, I can't, I've heard it all. There's no, no other business that I'm shocked at what they're selling and how much they're earning something else will come up. Yeah. And I love human nature because we, you know, there's so many things that we're willing to pay for and so many skills that we have, that people have that are just fascinating. Mm -hmm. You just need yeah. to be able to dream it. And most people can make it happen if they're, they're focused. Yeah. Well, you have just given tons of great information. Thank you so much, Tracy, for sharing all these insights. And I really appreciate Visit Financial Fitness. Thank you, Kathy. It's been my pleasure. So fun to uh, talk with all of, with all, you on all of this stuff. Thank you for listening to Dare to Leap. Say hello and access additional resources at virtualexperttraining.com. There you'll be able to connect with Kathy to share her feedback and join her community. Join us again soon on Dare to Leap. Until then. Mm -hmm.